what's up guys? Today, I'll show you a crime thriller drama film, The Countess. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with Count Istvan visiting the late Countess Ursevit's grave at Ext. As he looks upon Ursevit's grave, he narrates the time of the past when she was still alive. In 1560, Ursevit was born in Ext, Hungary. She was a daughter of a noble military general. On her christening, she was immediately promised to marry Count Mandasti. During her childhood, her mother taught her to embrace coldness, cruelty, harshness, and curiosity in the world. Such traits showed visibly to everyone. She felt no sorrow when her father died, and even dared to touch his corpse. She planted a chick inside a pot, thinking it would grow in a tree, but her teacher explained that only seeds are planted in dirt, whereas humans and animals suffocate when buried. During her youth, she attended a baby boy's christening in church and desired to marry him. However, her mother opposed the idea, for Ursebet would be too old when the boy reached the marrying age, and besides, she was to marry Nandasti. However, she fell in love with a peasant who later impregnated her, but Ursebet's mother forbade such foolishness and ordered the peasant's death. She had to watch the brutal death sentence against the peasant, and afterward, her mother locked her in a room as punishment so they could hide her pregnancy. When Ursebet's baby was born, her mother immediately took away the child, even though it was against Ursebet's will. At age 15, Ursebet married Nadasti, but it was followed by Ursebet's mother's death. Ursebet grew old as a wise countess. She managed her estate masterfully and became wealthier to the point where the nobilities and even the town's king owed her and her husband money. Later in life, Ursebet and Nadasti had two daughters and a son. However, the couple barely spent time together, for Nadasti was busy with a war against the Turks' army, who slaughtered and enslaved half the population of Hungary for less than 50 years. Later, Ursevit founded a hospital for the poor, but townsfolks noticed that the majority of her patients never came out alive. Ursevit was a Protestant who believed in heretic theories. She had a claim which, working under her, helping with managing her wealth to the extent that people thought she knew how to create gold. Nadasti's deadly military prowess and Ursevit's intelligence combined made them the most feared, respected, and influential family in the kingdom. After a fearsome battle against the Turks, Nadasti returned to Vienna and demanded the pending payment from the king. Unfortunately, the king lied, saying they were preparing the money, but they were short of it. The king offered to stay for a while, but Nadasti couldn't wait and asked the king's men to follow up on the payment instead. When Nadasti and his men left the king's castle, the king's attendant gave him a golden chalice as a gift from the king. Meanwhile, Ursebet played with her children in the forest, and upon hearing her husband and his men arrive, they excitedly welcomed him. However, Nadasti returned home with a disease contracted from abroad, and he died on the same day. The following day, Ursebet attended her husband's burial ceremony in the local church. Later, she went to Vienna with her children and left Kachtis under the witch's management. At Vienna, Ursebet talked with the king about the court's recognition of her as the sole owner of her husband's army and Kachtis estate, which the king eventually accepted. Afterward, Ursebet visited her aunt's mansion to leave the children there. She first shared a humorous dinner with nobilities, and among them was Count Jarji. After dinner, Count Jarji offered a marriage proposal for her, but it would be improper for Ursebet, for she was a noble by blood, whereas he was a count by marriage. Her aunt then fetched Ursebet, and they attended a night ball. At the night ball, Ursebet met Jarji's 21-year-old son, Istvan. Ursebet elegantly danced with him until the music ended. There was this burning passion brewing in their hearts that led them to wrestle their smelly tongues, and when it was time for Istvan to go home, Ursebet invited him to a furious hormone night in bed. The following morning, the unsatisfied Ursebet caressed Isfan's hormone-filled skin, but withdrew her hand when she saw her wrinkly skin. Before Ursebet left, Isfan gave her his necklace and promised her written letters weekly. For the first time, Ursebet felt love and hormones to fill the emptiness in her heart. Ursebet returned to Kachtis and relayed all the happenings with Isfan to the witch. However, the witch only warned her that a young hormone-rich man like Isfan changed their mind all the time and there was no certainty that he loved her at all. Ursebet wished to be alone and stared at herself in the mirror. She sighed, for how time has no respect for beauty. Then she received another letter from Isfan. Not long after, they met again and entangled their bare hands and legs in bed. Isfan shared he was to marry a baroness from Denmark, but his heart belonged to Ursebet. When Isfan was asleep, Ursebet cut off and smelled a strand of his hair, but unfortunately, spared his smelly sausage. A week later, Ursebet visited the church and prayed. The church's priest thanked her for the donations, and she only said it was only right that God had given her too much. Outside the church, Ursebet waited for Isfan's letter. 
While waiting, a young beggar complimented her dress, and out of generosity, Ursebet gave her a golden ribbon. The following day, Ursebet finally received Isvan's delayed letter containing an invitation to a ball. Ursebet attended the party and waited, but no familiar face arrived. While waiting, Count Dominic spoke to her, but Ursebet showed no interest in continuing the conversation. Amidst their conversation, a servant called her, saying that a man was looking for her. Ursebet gladly followed and met Isvan again, but he couldn't stay with her longer that night. But he promised to elope with Ursebet tomorrow and that they'd be together in the coming days. Soon after, they parted with a soft tongue massage and left the ball. The following day was nothing Ursevet expected. She waited until sunset, but Isvan stood her up. She left him a letter, expressing her disappointment and pain. It turns out, Count Jarji locked up Isvan in the cellar, because he learned his plan to escape with Ursevet. Jarji believed that Isvan was just another minion of Ursevet, but Isvan believed she loved him, and so his true love for her. Isvan resisted following his father's wish to travel to Denmark to meet his future wife, but Jarji lied, saying Ursebet had already forgotten him and chose to spend time with Domine. Back to the present, Isvan narrates that after the separation from Ursebet, everything he knew about her is only through relayed stories. He only learned the truth about Ursebet from his father, who was on his deathbed. In between his father's screaming words, he realizes that what people know about Ursebet are lies. Back in the past, Ursebet still waited for Isvan, but Dominic kept on pestering her, so she accepted his invitation eventually. They rode horses, chatted, and encountered an elderly beggar. Ursebet shouted at the beggar for being ugly, and the beggar responded that sooner, Ursebet would become old like her. So Ursebet punished the beggar in front of everybody out of anger. Ursebet returned home in a sour mood. She smelled Isvan's hair to keep herself sane, and prayed to the Lord, asking why her true love disappeared so quickly. That night, she cut her left bosom, inserted Isvan's hair, and sewed it close, for she wanted to keep him forever in her heart. Three weeks passed, and Ursebet, the powerful countess in land, was ill from being heartbroken. Such news reached Count Jarji, and he wished to find proof of Ursebet's lunacy. Ursebet finally received a letter from Isvan, but it was about his farewell for her and his devotion to his new wife. The letter's content angered Ursebet, but the witch calmed her down and pleaded with her to forget about Isvan. But Ursevet persisted that it must be their age difference that caused their failed relationship. She even compared herself to the young maid in her bedroom. Suddenly, Dominic visited Ursevet. During the meal, Ursevet got furious when the servant spilled some drink onto her clothes. Ursevet wanted to punish the servant, but Dominic stopped Ursevet and instead offered himself to be the target of her anger, so he allowed Ursevet to whip him with a belt. The following day, Ursevet drowned herself with sorrow again and thought that the beggar in the park cursed her to be old and wrinkly. She even shouted at the witch, for giving her ointment that wasn't effective anymore. Afterward, Ursebet asked the young maid from yesterday to brush her hair, when she unexpectedly pulled Ursebet's hair too hard. Ursebet's anger triggered once more, to the extent that she beat the young maid with a brush, and the maid's blood splashed on her face. Ursebet wiped off the blood in front of the mirror, but stopped, as if a miraculous event occurred in her very eyes, because she saw her wrinkly face glow younger. Everything Ursebet saw in the mirror of glowing and getting younger were mere hallucinations, but she firmly convinced herself that bathing in a virgin's blood could help her attain eternal beauty of youth, which her sycophantic servants tolerated and insisted that the blood did miraculously work. However, the witch was against this idea, but Ursebet continued to harvest blood from the healing wound of the young virgin maid. However, when her wounds completely healed, Ursebet ordered her servant to cut her open and extract blood from the cuts. Unfortunately, the maid died from blood loss after many harvests. So Ursebet ordered her servants for more virgins. Her sycophantic servants captured virgin maids and maidens in town and killed them inside a cage with deadly spikes. This torture weapon design aimed to impale maidens' bodies without wasting too much blood. Back to the present time, Istvan tells everyone that despite his numerous letters sent to Ursebet, he never received one from her. He'd have thought that Ursebet might be doing well with the war, but little does he know her evil doings. Back in the past, Dominic slept with Ursevet for a night. When she was finally asleep, Dominic roamed and searched the castle, but the witch caught him. They fought about being Ursevet's favorite person, and Dominic bragged that he was Ursevet's current favorite. But despite the witch's opposition to Ursevet's drastic changes of personality and desires in life, she continued to guard Ursevet's back, especially against an ambitious man like Dominic. Years had passed, and too much death occurred on the estate, causing the villagers to panic and believe that a devil must be living among them because of the scattered maidens' corpses in the woods, because there was no more space for proper burials. The wolves feasted over the rotting corpses, and flies occupied the once beautiful place. 
It was one morning, Ander Sibbett was updating her journal, filled with precise records of every murder. She wrote that the peasant blood was too harsh for her skin. While writing, the witch was sick and sought Ur Sibbett's presence, but Ur Sibbett declined the invitation to see her. Meanwhile, the townsfolks addressed the murders to the priest and speculated it was Ur Sibbett's evil acts. So that night, the priest sent a valet to deliver a warning letter to the king, and he wanted to escape with the donations. But the king's attendant caught him, saying that the priest betrayed Ur Sibbett. He ordered his man to chase after the valet and killed the priest. That night, Dominic, who slept with Ursebet again, sneaked into her torture basement while she was asleep and found Ursebet's journal, which was crucial evidence. Ursebet woke up and found her servant panicking. She informed Ursebet that Dominic escaped with the journal and that the witch had died. The following day, Ursebet read the last letter the witch wrote for her, containing her devotion for Ursebet and how nothing is permanent in the world, but there is beauty when time lets it. So Ursebet decided to visit her children in Vienna, but the town folks mobbed her Ferrari coach and named her a witch. Ursebet returned to her castle because of the mob and let a valet fetch her children. At home, she was ill from blood withdrawal, and so her servants brought a young girl that night. But Ursebet recognized she was the young beggar because of the golden ribbon. She grabbed her arms and shouted at her to leave this place or she would die. The young beggar escaped the castle, but upon reaching the woods, Dominic killed her. Along with him were two aristocrats. Dominic gave the two aristocrats to Ursebet's servants for Ursebet to kill. Ursebet faced the two aristocrats, but one of the aristocrats turned out to be Istvan's wife, who oddly said that she hadn't seen Istvan for years. Out of anger, even though it was against her to harvest from a married woman, she slitted Istvan's wife's neck. The following day, Jarji invited Ursebet's children and her aunt to see the young beggar's torn corpse and claimed it was done by Ursebet herself. Meanwhile, peasants from the Kachtis estate arrived in Vienna to address Ursebet's tortures and murders done to a priest, maidens, and aristocrats. However, the king showed no interest in resolving such issues until his servant explained that if Ursebet was proven guilty of using witchcraft, the king would be clear of his debts to her and could seize her estate. The king's attendant, who eavesdropped on the conversation, entered Jarji's office, and inside were Dominic, Jarji, and his son Isfan. He immediately informed Jarji that the king learned that Ursebet was suspected of murders and witchcraft. But Jarji made an alternative plan. He let Ursebet's children sign an agreement, allowing the court to charge their mother with murder, but without mentioning the witchcraft, for them to be able to inherit Kachdis castle, but the rest of the estate and military would go to Jarji. This agreement might sound unfair, but this would lead Ursebet no choice, but to agree for her children's sake, or else the king would take everything from her and her children's welfare. Jarji sent his son and the king's attendant to investigate if all the speculations were true. Istvan and the king's attendant arrived, and Ursebet welcomed them with a warm dinner. However, flies continued to disrupt their meal, but little did they know it originated from hidden corpses. It had been five years since they saw each other, and Ursebet wished to be alone with Istvan. Soon after, Ursebet confronted Istvan with his farewell letter, containing his love for the Baramis of Denmark, but Istvan denied writing such things. Istvan realized his father had fabricated the letter. The two shared a muscle wrestling on bed, and the moment Ursebet was asleep, Istvan and the king's attendant searched the Kachdis castle for evidence. Truth couldn't be hidden, for they found Ursebet's torture basement and a room of corpses. The movie ends with Ursebet and her servants facing trial and punishment for all the murders. Her servants suffered from immediate death for being Ursebet's accomplice in killings, and Jarji chose to destroy the evidence for Ursebet in order to have an untainted name in the town. Afterward, she signed an agreement to bequeath all her possessions to Jairji to cede Kachdis to her children and free the king from all his debts. Before breaking her up completely in her room as punishment, Ursebet commented how Jairji masterfully orchestrated a plan just to obtain wealth. She believed she'd meet death with sanity and not a lunatic, unlike Jairji's description of her to others. As Ursebet suffered inside the brick room, she asked the Lord how men were praised when they murdered others, while she, a woman who murdered the same, was sent to jail. Ursebet committed suicide, for she could no longer handle the agony of biting off her flesh. The church didn't give her a coffin, nor a proper burial, but only dumped her straight into the dirt and buried her. In the present, Istvan leaves Ursebet's grave and wonders if all the accusations of her being a bloodthirsty murderess are true or just fabricated lies by his father. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.